Hey, welcome again to Discovery Church. How many excited you came to church today? Amen. Amen. We're in this series, The Names of God, part seven of it, actually. Let me look into the camera. Welcome everybody online, all of our online family, those of you in our outdoor courtyard, Northwest Cal State. So glad you are part of the Discovery family. Come on, Southwest. Welcome everybody joining in with us right now. Man, this has been an amazing season, I believe, of God revealing himself to us and us getting closer to God by, by understanding his names, that, that he wants to be revealed. He wants to show himself as provider, as peace, as, as warrior in our life. And, and I believe that not only is it an understanding thing, but it is an, it's an actually application. It's a real thing. It's a revelation thing. Let me show it to you in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 6. Again, our theme verse, God says, I will reveal my name to my people and they will come to know its power. If you miss any of these messages, you should go watch them online. They're all, they're all archived there on our website or on YouTube. But here's what I want you to be. I don't want you to just understand more about God and know more about his name. The Bible says, God didn't say you will understand my name. He said, I will reveal my name. That there is revelation that God wants to impart to you about who he is. So that in the moment of your anxiety, in the moment of your terrified state, that you actually turn your heart to God and he reveals himself to you as Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. That in the moment of your lack or your limitation or in the moment of your need, that you would turn your life to God in that moment and he would reveal himself. There would be revelation of Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. So it's more than just an understanding and knowledge. It's revelation in the moment of need. God shows himself who he is in your life. Can I get an amen, somebody? So, so we're going to take a break in our Jehovah names that we've been studying to share, I think, one of the most foundational names that marks our relationship with God in Christ. And it's the name Abba. Somebody say Abba. It means God our Father. There's, it's really deeper than that. I'll explain it to you. But if I were to ask you to explain your relationship with God and your faith to me, like if you were to explain that and then you begin explaining it and you miss any of this language about your relationship with God as father and you as a son or a daughter, if that is lacking in your definition, your description of your relationship or your faith with God, then then it's a very clear to me that you would be an immature Christian. If a Christian at all, if you do not understand that God is our father and you are his daughter and his son. This, this is all throughout scriptures we see this, but Jesus actually came to reveal who God truly is to us. And he says in Mark chapter 14, verse 36, he's talking to God, his father in the garden. And it is the moment before he's the garden of, uh, of Gethsemane, before he's going to be crucified and punished and take our punishment upon him. And he calls him Abba, Father. I'll explain to you more what that means in a moment. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Some of you may have heard different definitions of Abba. Maybe it's something new to others of you. But, but some people have said that a good definition, English translation of Abba is daddy because it's a term of endearment and of intimacy. And it's a good definition. It might even be awkward for you to think of even calling God daddy or hearing someone else call him daddy it may feel kind of awkward. But I hope today that you would get a revelation of a more endearing relationship with your father, that, that he wants to be known and revealed to you in your life as Abba, father. But really, this word Abba does not fully translate over, much like a lot of the Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek words. There really isn't one English word often that can encapsulate the meaning because it's not only a, a very intimate term, uh, Abba, it's one of power, really. So write it down like this. Abba is not just a name of intimacy. It's a name of honor and obedience, so that's kind of lost in the daddy part. That's where we get the intimacy, where you can see. But probably a better translation is both. It's probably daddy father. It's probably not one. It's probably daddy father, because there's this honor and obedience that comes with this word Abba. It was so important that, that Jesus wanted you to know how to relate to God this way. He modeled it for us. But when he taught his disciples and when he teaches us how to pray, this shows up in the Lord's prayer immediately in Mark chapter 14 verse or Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 rather Jesus says pray like this look what he says our 
Father, we need to pray and learn how to pray initially when you first start. Come to God as a son and as a daughter. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We have to learn how to pray this way, church. We have to learn how to say Father because it's the most important word we utter when we talk to God. Unless we say Father and like mean it from our hearts, then every other word that you say is useless and meaningless. Unless you say and mean Father. If we don't learn to say and mean it, then we really don't have or know the intimacy and the authority or have a real connection with God. God wants us to call him Father. I believe that we have a flawed view of fatherhood put forward by less than perfect parents that creates a barrier to us actually relating to God the way that he wants to be related to us. None of us have perfect parents, by the way. None of us have perfect fathers and none of us are perfect parents ourselves, but some of us may have had to deal with father figures who failed us. Maybe you can relate to the five most typical fathers as depicted in some popular TV and movie characters that some of us grew up with, okay? Let me lighten this message up just a little bit, okay? Five typical, the most typical fathers that we see today is the Homer Simpson dad, the Homer Simpson dad, okay? This is the angry father, the angry, unpredictable father, what he does is he instills fear into his children. But what happens if we have this kind of father, it translates in our relationship with God and we view God as a tyrant who uh, is, acts in unexpected ways, demanding ways, the angry father. Or how about the red foreman, the critical father? I'm not going to say what he told his kids and how he, what he said to his kids, but he was critical. He was demanding. He made his kids feel inadequate. And we have this kind of father. We end up seeing God as a taskmaster who's never pleased. We try to please him, but we never can get on the good side of the critical father. Then there's the Michael Corleone. Maybe not the drug dealer father. Some of y'all think I was going drug dealer route. For some of you, yes, but other, I'm talking about the absent father here the absent father, the uninvolved father. That father sends a message to his children that they are unimportant. And, and we translate that in our relationship with God when we have this kind of father, that God is too busy for me. He really doesn't care about all my needs and involved in the details of my life. Or here's another uh, popular father, the Darth Vader father. He's the arrogant father. And if you don't know Dar you know, Star Wars lore, then you don't get why he's an arrogant father, okay? He's tough, he's hard, he's uncaring in his nature, but it leads the children to feel unloved. And when we have that kind of father, we, we don't believe that God can love us. Or here's the last one, the Al Bundy dad. The fault-finding father or the abusive father. He communicates to his children that they are worthless. And we relate to God in a place of condemnation instead of community and connection. So many of us had a dad in title, but we didn't have one in spirit. And because of that, we developed an orphan spirit. No, no, you're not an orphan. I know you're not an orphan, but because of the spirit that was operating in your home, you developed a spiritual condition of, or, or, of orphanhood. Jesus actually talked about this in John chapter 14, verse 8. He said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'll come to you. No, he wasn't talking about physical orphans. He was talking about a he went, spiritual condition that we can have. We can be spiritual orphans. And spiritual orphans come from rejection, abandonment, abuse, or betrayal. And when we have that in our life, especially when we're growing up from the people in authority figures in our life, when we have abandonment and rejection, abuse, and betrayal, it will always manifest in loneliness and isolation. Spiritual orphans, if you're a spiritual orphan today, you have trouble connecting with people, being honest and real and vulnerable, especially to your spouse. You have, you have trouble, spiritual orphans have trouble connecting to their spouse, trouble connecting with our children, or maybe one of the genders of your children, like you connect more with some of them than you do with the others because of this wound that you have, or even people in authority. Spiritual orphans can't connect with those in authority at work or even the church. It's hard for us to connect with authority figures because what the authority figures in our life did to us. Spiritual orphans, let me give you a list of things just to see if this kind of connects in any way as we talk about Abba Father and what may be in the way of us relating to God this way. Spiritual orphans struggle 
with feelings of inadequacy. Spiritual orphans continually compare themselves with others, what they have and what we don't have. Spiritual orphans secretly compete with the people around them in their life. They're always trying to do something that give them a sense of validation and, and, and it never satisfies. They're always trying to do something else that validates their worth. They're haunted by rejection and failure. Now, if you see any of this playing out in your life, then it's very likely that you have an orphan spirit. There's a popular story in the Bible that depicts this spirit so well. It's the story of the prodigal son. Long before the son decided to leave the father, he was dealing with this spiritual condition of orphanhood. See, because this like, it has nothing to do with your proximity to a father. It has to do with your perspective of your father. And this is so important that you actually understand this because you could have had a good father at home, but your perspective towards your father or the circumstances of your home can create strongholds or spiritual conditions of bondage. You can be in the church and hear every sermon, but receive it from the wrong spirit. Are y'all hearing me today, you guys, okay? We, we know this about the prodigal son because of what he actually said. This son, for those of you that aren't familiar with the story, this son takes his father's inheritance and wastes it, squanders it, parties and gambles and prostitutes. And when he's at the very end of the barrel, the end of his brokenness and despair, the Bible says this, he finally comes to his senses and says, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. He starts out really well, but look what he says next. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Oh, what a twisted mindset to think that something that you can actually do, your actions and your disobedience can affect your standing with your father. I'm no longer worthy because of what I've done to be a son. Make me like one of your slaves, like your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. What a sad, false reality that some people live in. That because of your disobedience, you think you're disowned by the father. He wanted to be a slave when he was actually a son. I want you to receive this truth today. It's available for you no matter what you've done. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Who you are is not determined by what you've done. Can you imagine, like, like what if, let me give you an example. What if my son hits his sister? He hits his sister, he's getting in trouble, okay? If he hits his sister, he's going to get in big trouble. I may take some things, I may take some privileges away. He may get the computer taken from him. He may, get, he may not be able to enjoy whatever we're enjoying as a family that night. He may get some grounding. But can you imagine if my son comes out of his room and goes, Dad, I'm so sorry, but can I at least be your son? Can you imagine the twisted mindset that that would take for someone to think that because they are receiving disobedience or less than favorable even things on earth or, or, or their own actions, their own failures, their own mistakes, that that somehow would cause them to fall out of the family of God. God says, no, you are a son of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And I believe God wants to reveal himself to you today as Abba, as Daddy, Father. In the next chapter in Galatians, he says some profound truths about this. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. He says, but when the set time had come fully, God sent his son born of a woman. And he had to experience that, born under the law, it says. So he'd experience everything that we go through, you guys. To redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption. Look at this. Adoption to sonship because you are sons God sent the spirit of his son. Time out right there for a moment. Listen to me. This is so, this isn't just a mindset. This isn't just an attitude. This isn't just a perception. This is a spirit that you can have inside of you through Christ Jesus. That spirit calls out, he says, Abba, Father. So you're not even addressing God religiously anymore, but relationally. You can have a spirit inside of you that creates a connection with God so deeply. And this may not be a big idea for some of you. Maybe you understand that God is, is, is father and you're children and God, you know, you're in the family of God. You understand the concept, but maybe you're not operating in the spirit. This was completely foreign to the Galatian church. This was all new stuff because their view of God was distant. 
like some of us may still have a view of God who's very distant, very holy, and we got to stay away. He's big. He's awesome. He's mad. You may touch the Ark of the Covenant and get striked with lightning and die and that kind of God. This is their concept of God up to that point. And I believe some of you still have some ideas like that of God that carry in into your Christian faith today. So he's saying, look, this is different. Now you can cry out, Abba, Father. Then he says this, so you are no longer a slave, but you're God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. I'm going to explain that in a minute. So I want to make sure that you understand the difference, because chances are there's some of us in here that could be operating by a wrong kind of relationship, where we're really operating out of an orphan spirit or this slave spirit, which that slave, that slave spirit, that it will always come from the orphan spirit, because you'll always want to attach yourself to something. You always want to. So if you have an orphan spirit, you'll become slave to something, something, anything. So, so some of you, you might love God and know about God, but you're operating in, in, with God as an orphan or a slave. How do we know the difference? And I pray God gives you some revelation today. How do we know the difference? Let me contrast the slave and the son today. Number one is this, the slave has a master. That's what a slave has, right? The slave has a master, and the master is always mad at you. He's always demanding something from you. When you approach the master, you fall on your face, and, and you hope that he's nice to you. So that's kind of the mindset. And I'm convinced that some people have this mindset. Some Christians have this mindset of God that when we see God, we got to fall down on your face. You better crawl, man. Crawl. Get down. There's actually a church in Mexico. I believe it's called the Church of Guadalupe. That This is actually how they go. To, they have a... a a custom that they travel from their home to the church on their knees, the whole way on their knees, because it's because it, it's a sign of respect. That and if you if you go there, you'll see a blood trail because you go through that enough miles to go to this church. You, the skin on your knees is like totally rubbed off completely, and they think it's respect to God. And there's this blood trail, people walking miles. That's not the spirit God wants you to operate by. That's the wrong spirit. The slave has a master. The son, write this down, has a father. So a father is much different. A father wants you to jump into his lap. He's going to tickle you a little bit. It's, gonna, it's a much different relationship. That's why Jesus, when he was on earth, he had a relationship with, with kids that you can see that these other rabbis, you don't see him having. They, they had to peel kids off of Jesus because they were so attracted to him. Now, you have to be a certain kind of person for kids to be attracted to you. You know what I mean? This picture of Hollywood Jesus, you know, this malnourished, skinny, somber, sad, you know, walking around all like sad face Jesus, that was not the Jesus. That, that could not be the Jesus that kids would be jumping up and doing his lap. Jesus might have, he must have been all, blah, 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 blah. he must have been like candy in his pockets giving out and stuff. It was a different Jesus, I think, than, than was pictured for us. The son has a father. This is so important, the difference. Watch Romans chapter 8. Same concept here, verse 15 and 16. The spirit you received, notice again, it's a spirit that you can receive today, does not make you slaves, so you live in fear again. By the way, the way that you know that you're operating as a slave or not, one of the ways you know is you fear God. You're afraid of him. Just think about that. So you don't operate in fear again. But rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption, there's that word again, into sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. You can always tell when you pray, how do you talk to God? In what terms do you talk to God? What words do you use to relate to him? The Bible says, cry out, Father, Daddy. I know it makes you feel uncomfortable to say that, but I want to change that today. And I believe God wants to change it, that you would relate to him in a more endearing way. There's some people that when they see me, they'll call me Reverend Jason or Reverend Hanish. Every time that happens, I know they don't know me. They got no relationship with me. I am not Reverend Hanish. How many of you know I'm that, okay? The people that know me call me Jason. PJ is a term, an endearing term. People call him PJ, Pastor Jason. Even one time, someone called me P. Jason. I said, stop, that's not it. I'm not, I don't like it. I don't like it. But listen to me, the name you call determines the relationship. That's why we're studying these names, because it's the name that you call actually determines the kind of relationship that you're going to receive. 
Let me show it to you, Matthew chapter 10, verse 41. Jesus said, he who receives a prophet in the what? In the name of a prophet shall receive the reward of a prophet. So in order for you to get the reward that's on the prophet in your life, you got to actually call the name of prophet a prophet. He says, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. So you, the way you call God, if you're not calling him Abba, Father, you're not receiving the reward of Father in your life. Similarly, if you're not, if you don't call me by my name, if you don't, if you don't know me as Pastor Jason, which I don't care, you call me that. But listen, what the Bible's saying is, if you don't know me and call me pastor, you're not going to receive the reward as me as your pastor in your life. If you just want to call me Jason and, and, call, and act like I'm just one of your buddies, then you're going to receive the reward of a buddy. You got enough buddies in your life, though. What you need is a pastor. Do you understand? What's he saying here? The name that you call determines what you're receiving from that relationship. Okay, here's, here's another one. The slave is an employee. That's what he is. I don't know if you've ever been at a, at a restaurant and you can tell that the people serving you, they're not owners of the restaurant. They're just, you can tell they're employees because owners act differently, don't you? We were at a restaurant here recently. There was tons of open tables, bunch of people waiting, and that hostess had no rush in her. She didn't care a bit, man. She just taking her time, number 54. You know, uh, if that, look, if that was an owner, every table would have been full, okay? Because owners act differently. I promise you, if she owned the business, every table, it w- it's just different. And some of us, if you see yourself as an employee of God, you're working for God and he's not really in your heart. In other words, you don't see Christianity as part of the family business. I'm telling you, it'll change your perspective and your relationship completely. See, the slave is an employee, but the son, on the other hand, is an heir. See, it's, it's your business. It's your house. So this church, this church, I don't work for God. I work with God. I'm an owner with God. So these aren't just the church's chairs. These are your chairs. That ain't just the church's drums. Those are your drums. That's not just the church's donuts. Those are your donuts. Okay? So so I'm telling you, I believe if you see it correctly, you'll treat it differently. Now, when I'm walking to my car and I see a piece of trash or a paper on the floor, guess what? That's my paper because it's my house. It's your house. And when we see a visitor wandering around, they're, they're my visitor. So I'm going to go up to that person and say, hey, can I help you find something? You know why? Because it's my house, and I'm hosting people in my house. It's, it's different when you act this way. Romans chapter 8, 17 says, now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. So in God's mind, you become part of everything he has, just as Jesus would have. Can I say something to you? This means everything Jesus has, he wants you to have. That's why Jesus said, greater things will you do than I've even done. God actually wants you to be blessed so that you can be a blessing. God wants you to be healed so you can heal others. God wants to set you free so you can set other people free from bondage and shackles. Here's the last one. The slave is driven by duty. Where you have to do it. Where, where, oh, I guess I got to go to church again today. Ah, yeah, I know I should read. I, I need to get back on my reading plan. Yeah, and I, haven't, I know I need to pray more. I know, I know. Oh, yeah, I'm scheduled to serve again. Oh, man, it's my month on. So Christmas at Discovery is coming up again, and we got all these services, and it's coming around, and we got a bunch of services and opportunities to serve, and we're going to start telling you about it. But those of you that have this kind of relationship with God are like, yes, Christmas is here again. How can we make a difference? And others of you are like, dang, that's a lot of services. (laughs) And some of you are like, oh, no, serving on that. Christmas is, is a family day. Wait a second, hold on. Christmas is about the birth of Jesus. Are you kidding me? It's like, are, can you see? Okay, it depends on how are you operating with God. Are you operating out of duty? Here's the difference, because the son is, is driven by devotion. Where I just love you so much. It is a joy for me to serve you, to honor you, to bless you. It is my desire and my, my devotion to. I love like the the best verse, verses in the Bible, a story in the Bible that describes the difference between these two is shown in Luke chapter 10. Look at it with me. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village 
where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted with all the preparations that had to be made. Let me pause right here and just say, they both loved Jesus. And they both wanted to give Jesus something, but they were doing it in different spirits. So it says, she came to Jesus and asked him, Lord, don't you even care about my sister? Let me do all the work by myself. Tell her, help me. That's the way I see this in the story. That's the spirit she's coming at Jesus with. And Jesus goes, Martha, you got a wrong spirit. Martha, let me, you're worried and upset. You got a wrong, you got a spirit of worry. You got a spirit of frustration, a spirit of anger about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one thing. And Mary has, here's the key word I love it. Mary has chosen. Did you know you can make this choice? It's not a feeling. It's a choice. You can make the choice. I'm going to be in this kind of relationship with God and it's better, he says. It's better. It's a better way. Devotion instead of duty. So how can we, if today you're You're operating from a different spirit, whether it's orphan spirit or a slave spirit, and you see yourself tilting on the other side of slave instead of son or daughter. How can you get a revelation of Abba today, of God, our Father? Let me give you a few steps for it, all right? To walk, what I'm calling to walk in sonship. This is what God has made available to you, to walk in this kind of relationship. How do we do it? Number one, you have to allow God to heal your father wound. Father wounds cause us to have this distorted view of our Heavenly Father. We tend to view our Heavenly Father through the lens created to us by our earthly fathers. Healing that wound, I'm telling you, is the first step to truly understanding and receiving truly the love of Abba Father. Each person's wound is shaped differently. These wounds are created from those what, false interpretation of events or the reality of some of our circumstances that we experience with the authority figures in my life, in our life. For me, my wound said, you're not enough, Jason. That's the wound I got. The wound I got, you're not enough. That's what was inside. I also, you're not valuable. That was what my wound from my childhood told me. You're not enough and you're not valuable. Now, God didn't create the wound, but he can heal it. And I'm gonna ask you to take a step today towards Abba. In order to do that, you got to allow God to heal it. And here's how you heal it. Here's the first thing you got to do. You got to forgive them. You have to forgive those authority figures in your life that hurt you, that abandoned you, rejected you, betrayed, that abused in any way. It's, in forgiveness, you guys, it's, we have this wrong, forgiveness is not forgetting. It's, it's not. People want who want to forget all that was done to them, they're going to find you can't do it. When God says he'll remember our sins no more, he's saying that he's not going to use the past against us. Forgetting is actually a long-term byproduct of forgiveness. It's never a means toward forgiveness. It's the byproduct of the ongoing act of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a choice. It's an act of your will. You don't have to feel it. Because God requires you to forgive, it's possible for you to extend it. Some of you hold on to your anger as a means of protecting you against any further abuse. But all you're doing is hurting yourself. Don't wait until you feel like forgiving. You'll never get there. Make the hard choice to forgive, even if you don't feel like it. It, it's, it's only when you choose to forgive that Satan loses his grip and hold on you and you begin to heal from your wounds. It's not waiting for the feeling to happen to then forgive. No, you got it backwards. You make the choice to forgive and then you open the door for God to start healing you of it. Let God heal the father wounds. Forgive, let those people go. Let the situations go. Stop holding on to it. And then not only do that, I know this is, these aren't in your notes, forgive them. But secondly, tell somebody else about it. After you tell God about it, 
And you say, God, this is the wound. This is what it told me. I, I, told me, I thought I wasn't enough, and I thought I wasn't valuable. I'm not going to let that voice and those wounds dictate and dominate my life anymore. Not only do you tell your father that, but then you go tell somebody else, hey, I, got, I have a wound from my past, and I'm forgiving. I'm letting go. You got, I don't care if you've never been in a small group ever before, you get into a small group this week. If you want to be healed, you get into a group and you open up to somebody and you tell them about your wound and that you're not going to let it dominate you anymore. If you want to know God this way, if you want to know Abba, if you want to be healed, you got to do it. James chapter 5, 16 actually tells us when we confess our sins to each other and pray for each other, we'll be healed. You will be healed if you confess this to God. You, you, you open that up, you say, God, I'm going to forgive him and then you go share it to a brother, go share it to another sister. Now listen, if you didn't have a great relationship growing up, a great family, you need to understand Psalm 68 says this, God is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing. Listen to me, you need a family. You need a spiritual family. Spiritual orphans need a spiritual family. Not just a church to go to, a spiritual family to belong to. And it doesn't matter the size of it, by the way. I know we've grown so much over the years. This is one of the things that people have said over the years. Like, man, if the church was just smaller, it would be easier to get connected. That's not truly how people... Closeness doesn't happen by the size of the family. It happens by the values of the family. So there could be a small family with just one child, two child, three child. It doesn't matter. If there isn't a value of intimacy, vulnerability, fellowship, connection in the family, then there's single... You know, there's only childs that that don't even know their parents. It's not about, it's closeness doesn't happen because of size. It's happened by values. And here at Discovery, this is a value. If this is gonna be your, your church, don't just attend here, join the family here. Get connected to a group here. Some brothers and sisters in Christ. Number one, allow God to heal your father wound. And then number two, you can start to see God as your Abba father, your daddy, your father. So it's got to begin with your eyes after your heart. How do you see him? You got to see God as a father. So when you come to God, what does that look like for you? What is your view of God? Because your view of him determines your relationship with him. What do you think he's like? That's going to determine how you relate to him. And that's why we need to start after we deal with the heart, we need to start with our vision. What does God look like? Matthew chapter seven explains it like this. Jesus said, which of you if his sons ask for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. Like nobody does that. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus was revolutionizing the mindset of people here because he's not this lightning bolt pillar of fire and smoke. No, he's a, a father who wants to give you good things. There's a problem with this though, because some of us have had bad earthly fathers and I'm personally convinced that affects and pollutes our view of who God is. In fact, I believe that the devil's plan between you and your father wasn't even really about you and your father. He just knew if he could be successful in causing that hurt and that wound in that relationship, then you would not be able to relate to God the right way if you didn't heal from it. You have to see God the right way way. Here's the third one. Now we can approach God. How though? How do we approach God? We got to approach God on the basis of relationships, not rules. Relationship. Okay, not the whole rule following. Some of you, you, you come to church and maybe you had a good week and you come to church and you can worship well and receive well because you feel really good about yourself and how you perform this week. But in other weeks where you said something you shouldn't have said, did something you didn't do, you come into church with your tail dragged and it's hard for you to worship God. Do you know what that means? That means you're operating by the wrong spirit. You're a slave. That's what you're, you're acting like a slave. You're acting like an orphan. That's not what God, that's not how God sees you. We got to learn how to operate relationally, not by rules. Most homes have a set of rules that you play by. Rules for the electronics, rules for bedtime, rules for sweets or, or meals and, and, and all that like play, all that stuff you got rules for. But every now and then, once in a while, you can fall into the favor of the father outside the rules. How many you know what I'm talking about? Okay. I remember one time I was studying and reading. I was in my office and my son came. This was years ago. My son came and sat down 
by me. And he stayed there. And I was like, well, you must want something. He's just chilling right here. So I stopped what I was doing. I said, hey, son, what's up? You need something? And he said, and he got up. And he said, I just want a hug, Dad. But I said, come here, boy, what you want? I, we went and got ice cream. It was 6 p.m. I'm like, come on, kid, I love you so much. Get in the car. I, that's, I'm telling you, there, I just, God wants you to relate to him this way. Your approach to God is so critical here that if you don't, the way you approach God in your prayer life, the way you approach God in your devotion life, the way you approach God in how you serve, the way you approach God and why you give and what you give and your money, all that stuff needs to be through relationship, not rules. The prodigal son story is actually the, it's probably more aptly titled the prodigal sons, plural. Because although one left and one stayed, the one who stayed, even though he had a loving father, he had an orphan spirit. Let me show it to you in Luke chapter 15. After the son comes home and they're throwing the party, look what it says. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all of these years, look what he says, I've been slaving. This is what I've been doing for you. I've been slaving and working and I've been hard at this. And he's seeing himself through the wrong lens. He's operating by a slave, even though he's a son and never even left the house. I've been slaving for you and I never disobeyed your orders. How many of you know that's an exaggeration for any son, any child? I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never give me even one goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, he doesn't even relate to his own brother as a family member. It's the son of yours, dad, who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home. You kill the fattened calf for him. And the father says, no, you're not a slave. Look what he says. My, my son, you're not slaving for me. You're my son. You're always with me. And everything I have is yours. You're crying for a goat? It's all yours, son. You're an heir of this house. Everything I have is yours. And you want a goat? Are you kidding me, kid? But we have to celebrate because, because this brother of yours, here's the right context of relationship. He's not just my son. This brother of yours was dead and is now alive again. He was lost is now found. This, this, if we want to get a revelation of Abba, we have to heal from the father wound, see him the right way, approach God differently, whether you went and squandered it or you stayed in the house, church, every week, most weeks, but operating by the wrong spirit. We need to operate by relationship, not rules. And lastly, number four, if you want a revelation of Abba, he needs your whole heart to do it. You can't get revelation from God with part of your heart. He has to have your whole heart. The way I like to say it is going all in. You got to go all in. It doesn't work any other way. Christianity, faith, church, all this stuff, it doesn't work unless you go all in. So let me say it this way. If you go 90% in, you're going to come to a place in your life and in your faith and in this journey where you go, this is too hard. I can't do it. No, I get it. You can't if you don't go all in. You can't do it. You're going to burn out and fade away. Jeremiah 29 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So the opposite, the antithesis of this verse is, so if you seek me with part of your heart, you'll never find me. You're going to be one of those that burn out and fade away because you didn't go all in. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. You can have this experience. You can have this relationship with Abba if you go all in. Let me close with this part of the story of the prodigal son. When he comes home and he just wants to be a slave, he's got the wrong mindset. I just work. Give me, make me a slave in your house. The father's response in Luke 15, no matter how far you've gone, no matter what you've done, whether you stayed in the house or you left, whether you squandered your inheritance you kept working hard for him. The father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put the family ring back on his finger. This is my son. Put the sandals on his feet. He's been walking, getting beat up by this. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. 
he was lost, and now he's found. See, this this spirit we're operating by, this orphan spirit, this slave spirit, whether you're in the house or not, he says you could be still in the house and dead. Hearing the message, but lost. Because you don't know who your father is. And I pray there's a revelation today of who he truly is, of Abba. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.